Hello. We're back. We're back. And it's good to see y'all or be seen by y'all. Uh, please say hello when you come in the room. So I know you're here. And uh, let's pray. So, Father, we thank you so much for the people that take the time to be here and be a part of our study and to watch us later in replays on YouTube. And I ask you to be with us right now and guide us through um, what you would have us understand about these scriptures. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, uh, we're back. I'm Mike, and this is our Friday, our uh, Facebook Live Bible study that I do every week, uh, if the Lord's willing. And um, I've been really uh, putting in a lot of hours writing, and I'm really excited about this material. We're in Chapter 7 now of um, Romans, and that's cool. And um, we've, been, we've been getting a lot of comments, you know, uh, after Bible studies about, uh, about the study. So that's very, very cool. So, um, good. So that's good. Uh, somebody has liked the study. I don't know if she's in here or not. Uh, yeah, there she is. Hey, Donna. It's hello. And hey, Joe. Thanks for letting me know you're in the room. Um, so we're in Romans chapter 7. Uh, verses 2 and 3. And so just to go back and look at uh, Romans 7, 1, uh, so we can get a good running start. Remember, Romans is a, is a um, letter. Romans is not a um, book. And so we call it the Book of Romans, but uh, it is really a letter, and letters don't have chapter breaks. And so... Um, Hey, Stacy Rogers, it's good to see you. And so, um, what we see in Romans 7 1 is a continuation of what we know as the last part of Romans 6. And so, he says, Do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? And the reason this is important is because as we get into the next section, and we started talking about this last time, we said, Often in the church, this section is taught. Uh, sound is not good. Can y'all hear me? Can uh, Joe and Stacy and Donna hear me well? Um, uh, David says the sound is not good. Uh, I don't know why it wouldn't be. Muffled and rough. How about now? How does it sound now? I don't know why it's muffled. I don't know. Um, I don't know if... I don't know. I have it set on... Um, sounds good now, Joe? Maybe I heard it. I had it turned up too loud. Okay, so I cut it, I cut it down a little bit and hope that helps. Okay. Um, the reason this is important is because this section in Romans 7 is often taught to, and I'll bring the microphone a little closer to me also, um, uh, it's been taught to, um, to teach against divorce, and certainly the scripture is clear that God hates divorce and all that sort of thing, but this section is not talking about divorce. It's using marriage um, as, as a covenant as an example that as long as a person's alive, they're uh, bound by what Paul calls, or, or basically uh, refers to as, as like the law of marriage. And so when, when people become married, there are things that coincide with the relationship of marriage. And that's uh, like sexual, sexual or intimate See uh, exclusivity with the spouse, that there's uh, matters of the heart, that you're not supposed to open up your heart to someone outside the marriage, and, and that there's uh, privacy within the marriage, and those sorts of things. And as long as both people are still alive, they're bound to that. So in, in uh, Romans 7, 2 to 3, Paul writes this. And he says, For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, but if the husband dies, 
she is released from the law of her husband. So then, while her husband lives, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, although she, though she has married another man. And so he's, he's pointing out that <coughs> under the law, <coughs> as long under the old covenant, as long as the woman is is um, and the man is still alive, they're still bound by the marriage vows. Now, I personally believe that when people get divorced, they're no longer bound by those vows. If they remarry, neither of them will be an adulterer or an adulteress because they're no longer married to the person they were married to before. And there's, there's contention about that in the body of Christ. But that's what I believe. I believe that you married because the culture that you're in pronounces you to be married, and the same culture that can do that can pronounce you to not be married anymore. And so if you remarry, you're not committing adultery by being married to another person. Because the person who came into existence when you were married has died. That The marriage person doesn't exist anymore. And so there are people who disagree with that, and I understand that. Um, but, but the point of these scriptures is that he's using the common relationship in the culture of the day and in our culture now to describe the relationship we have with the law just like um, the marriage relationship um, has certain expectations to it. So here we are in, um, in this verse, it says, For the, the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the man dies, she is released from the law of her, of her husband. So he's talking about a marriage law, which I, I described as the expectation uh, when you're in a committed relationship, like an actual real marriage, which to clarify is between uh, one person who's always been male and another person who's always been female. So any of the variations that exist in our culture today aren't really marriages. They're called that because um, the left is using the language against Christendom and against God's word. But, but when a man who's always been a man is married to a woman who's always been a woman, Married, always been a woman, then they have a biblically sound marriage, and as long as they're both alive, they're bound to the expectations of that vow. You know, sexual um, exclusivity and all that. If the man dies, or if the woman dies, then their then a surviving spouse is now no longer a spouse. They're a widow. That's why they don't call themselves the wife anymore or the husband anymore. They call themselves a widow, a widow, or widower. And I personally believe that if someone uh, maliciously divorces a person, they create a widowhood or a, a widowerhood in the other person against their will. So there are people who, in this culture now, if someone wants to divorce someone in two months, they could be divorced whether they want to be divorced or not, and it puts them into a place of forced widowhood or widowerhood. And, and, um, but, but they're no longer bound to the spouse for the things that spouses are bound to one another for, you know, matters of the heart and exclusivity and that sort of thing. As hard as some ministers try to make these verses be about divorce, they aren't. They simply talk about how death frees a person from their obligations. They are presented here because when we were saved, and, and hear this, this is very important, when we're saved, we die to who we were, and, and, and also we die to the law. So it frees us from the law. This is exactly the case in a marriage when a spouse dies. The survivor is no longer married to the deceased. Now the word release, he says in verse 2, so then if a husband lives, 
she marries another man, she'd be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law, freed. I'm sorry, in verse 1, the word released. The woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. That word released comes from a Greek word, kept ark eho, and it means to be idle or to render inactive. It's a compound Greek word. So the complete word study dictionary has a little comment about this, and I will um, I will share that here. And I'm going to put it with the paragraph that I just read to you. so that you can see how this word, this Greek word, is spelled. The word released comes from K-A-T-A-R-G-E-A-O. The kata gives the meaning of, of to make or cease, as in Hebrews 2.14. Paul uses it often uses it to signify more than hindrance or sensation from our, our outward activity, thus to rest. So, let's say, because uh, I am, let's say I'm married to my wife, Lori, and somebody, uh, a female person, um, begins to give signals that she is flirting, for example. Uh, which doesn't happen a whole lot, but it has happened over the years. Um, um, I can't rest when it comes to that sort of thing. I have to be active and I have to be vigilant about those things. Why? Because there is an active law in my life of being married to this woman, which I like, and I enjoy being married to her. So I can't just be clueless and, find, and 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 um, allow that to go on. So there have been times when I was counseling in Houston, where uh, one person f uh, was was real flirty, and another and in another instance, the person outright, you know, made a proposition. And in both cases, the law of marriage in my life went into effect. And, and, I, and I basically said, stop right where you are. It's time for you to leave. And they said, why? And I said, because I have a, a marriage commitment to my wife, and you know that, and you're disrespecting her by doing this, and you have to go. You have to leave. But, and when can I come back? Never. There's plenty of female counselors. At, in Houston, there were female counselors in our counseling center, and we could have reassigned them to them. Um, one time when it happened here, never. There's other female counselors in town because uh, I work by myself here. And so the idea is that I couldn't rest like, like the, um, this, this uh, complete word study dictionary talks about. Now, for a man, there was a man who um, uh, I, was, I was a hospice chaplain for his wife as she was dying of cancer. And, and as long as they, she was alive, he was bound by his vow of marriage. And he was true to her. And he, he really took good care of her. He loved her. He was bewildered because he didn't expect she would die before him. And she passed. And about a year later, I learned that he had uh, struck up a relationship with another woman. And it was okay to do that because he didn't have to be vigilant to keep his vow to his first wife because his first wife wasn't alive anymore. Am, am I over-communicating this, or is this making sense? So, so these people weren't released, and that's the word that is used in the New King James, the NIV, the New American Standard, and the complete Jewish Bible. These people aren't released in terms of being in bondage to marriage. If we just look at it from an English perspective, that's what it sounds like. However, when we pledge to be married to someone, there are expectations. 
like soul-to-soul -soul intimacy, physical intimacy, honesty with their spouse, etc., which are part of God's intentions for holy matrimony between a man and a woman. However, when a spouse dies, the context of the relationship changes since we cannot remain married to a dead person. The relationship is over. In the same way, our relationship with the lost ceases when we die with Christ. Now, I want to I mention something. I know a lot of people, men who have been widowed, you know, who are widowers, and women uh, whose husbands died, and they were just... My mother was like this. When my, when my father died, my mother, there was no way in the world she was going to consider being married to someone else because she just... She just, I don't, it, it's her prerogative, right? That was her prerogative. And I know, I know other widows now that are content to have been married to a person that they loved and were loved by that much. There are others I know that have gone on to remarry. And it's, it's totally their call. And it's, it's, and really, I think, ideally for us born again people, it's what God leads us to. If God leads us to marry someone later, uh, if, if we become um, separated by death, um, then that's, that's his call. And, and I think that we should give grace to people who, um, who choose to stay as a widow and not to marry someone else, or a guy to stay unmarried even though his previous wife has died. We should also extend grace to those who uh, believe they're supposed to marry somebody else. It's, it's their own call. I, um, I've presided over marriages for that. And I believe that that's a beautiful thing. If God chooses to connect you with someone else, I personally believe that I'm married to the perfect person for me. I couldn't see, if something happened to Laurie, I couldn't see marrying somebody else. I just couldn't. I just love her and I feel like I've had the best, and I just couldn't imagine. And I know a lot of nice ladies, but, you know, it's just that she is, she's ideal. And I just couldn't do that. But it's, it's theirs, right? But, but the purpose for this, these two verses in Romans 7, is to, is to show a parallel between the commitment we had to the law, even as Gentiles, that we died when we were baptized into Christ. And so the relationship between us and the law is as dead as the relationship between a husband and wife is when their spouse dies. We're no longer in relationship with the law, so we no longer have to live that way. That's why I, I believe that we shouldn't per se live according to the Ten Commandments. And that might sound like blasphemy, to you or heresy but hear me out I did a study when I was a younger Christian and I can find every one of the Ten Commandments in the New Covenant but not from the same perspective not as an outside list of do's and don'ts bearing down on me and forcing me to behave in certain ways but because the scripture talks about the fact and we're going to look at that in a little bit, that the new covenant, the new law is written on our hearts and that we are to honor the, what we call the Ten Commandments in our everyday life as born-again people under the new covenant from a different prompting, not from an outside list of rules forcing me to behave, but out of gratitude to the Lord and living in obedience to the Holy Spirit, which has written these on our human hearts. We'll, we'll go on and see. Now imagine if we tried to have a valid relationship with the spouse who has died. It would never work because that season has passed and the grace that the deceased had from God to be a husband or wife has stopped flowing. So when a husband's wife dies, he no longer has, has grace for a wife because he doesn't have a wife anymore. He has a, a deceased spouse. 
So he doesn't have grace from God for the current relationship because the current relationship has ceased because his spouse or her spouse has died. In the same way, whatever grace the law had to affect our lives stopped flowing the moment we were born again. It will never work for us again. Still, many church styles and many denominations try to live the old covenant law in these new covenant times by pushing a legalistic style of Christendom. And it will never work. What it does is it kills people inside. Listen to how Paul, and I'm going to paste the script, these scriptures there, how Paul, a former Pharisee, an expert in the law with the capital L, describes it from the perspective of one who has been freed from bondage. Now you know he loved the law. But listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 3, 4-9. This has affected me ever since I first really did a, a deep study of 2 Corinthians, of First and 2 Corinthians. Eventually we'll be doing that through these studies here. I want to I wanna teach every book of the New Testament. Not sure about Revelations yet, but we have plenty of other books to go through. He says, And such trust we have through Christ toward God, not that we're sufficient of ourselves, to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who has also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now listen as he compares the old covenant inscribed on physical pieces of stone, the, ten, the tablets, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, as he compares that to what we have now in Christ. And he's going to go through it, and he's going to use some pretty weighty terms, but it's important for us to see it and to get it so we can understand what he's saying in Romans. Hey, Benjamin, it's good to see you, my friend. Um, it's important for us to see this as, as we try to get what he's saying in Romans 7, 2, and 3. He says... He has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but from the Spirit. Hey, Liz, it's good to see you too. He says, because or for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if or since the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so glorious that the children of Israel couldn't look directly or steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance. Remember, his face was shining so much he had to cover it with a cloth. Which glory was passing away, so he, his face, the light was fading coming off his face. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be much more glorious than that? Because if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Now if you've heard me teach, you know I, I, I esteem the Bible highly, and I esteem the Old Testament highly. And I love the Ten Commandments which are in Exodus 11. But, Exodus 20, I'm sorry, Exodus 20. Um, but listen to the words that Paul an apostle under the New Covenant, a Pharisee, an expert in the law under the Old Covenant, how he refers to the Old Covenant. And it's clear because you can see, you can see, um, he says that, uh, you know, uh, something written and engraved on stones. He's obviously referring to the Old Covenant Ten Commandments, right? He, he calls it he says they kill. He says they are the ministry of death. He says they are the ministry of condemnation. Now when modern Christian ministers who teach legalistic doctrine do that, 
This is what they bring to the people in their congregations. They bring something which kills, they bring death, they bring condemnation. And if you spend a lot of time in these legalistic groups, you'll see there ain't a whole lot of smiling going on. Usually they're uh, grim. It's just a grim bunch, right? And it's, why? Because they're constantly being bombarded with the law. They're, they're like, like, for instance, there was a, a, um, an Asian group. I'm not going to label a group. But uh, in the counseling center where I was in um, Houston, two of the people that worked under me as, as the coordinator of that counselor, of that counseling center, were from this Asian group. And they attended an, an, this Asian congregation, which was fairly nearby where we worked. Um, and one night, the, the leaders of this congregation showed up at their house and they were going to everybody in the congregation and they were saying, we're going to build a new building and you need to write me a check right now for $2,000. It wasn't ask the Lord what, you think he sh what he thinks you should do. It wasn't to pray about it and see. It was legalistic. Uh, they bound the law on them, just like Jesus talks about in Matthew 23. They bound a heavy load to their backs, just like Jesus tells the Pharisees they do. You bind heavy loads on their bodies, and, and um, you won't even lift a finger to help. And that's what they were doing. It was legalism, and it was death. And you could see it all over these people. And the next day when they came into the counseling center and we had our meeting, I said, hey, can I talk to you after everybody else leaves? And I go, what's wrong? I can tell by your countenance that something's wrong. Your face looks like you're struggling. And they were like, well, I dumped these, these obligations on us yesterday. And now we had a cultural issue because of their Asian descent and wanting to worship with people who spoke their language in worship, but a legalistic Old Covenant style that was bringing death into their life. Am I making sense? Because I'm trying to, I'm trying to show that legalism seeps into all kinds of New Covenant worship styles. And you really have to be on your toes to see it. We have a new bridegroom we're in a new marriage to Christ. We are the bride. He is the bridegroom. And just like I'm vigilant to watch over what comes into my marriage with my wife, I have to be vigilant of what comes in to my marriage to, the, to our Lord. Are we going to let someone put obligations on us that our Lord Jesus wouldn't put on us because he's freed us? So, so he says, let me see, in Romans 7, 2 to 3, and I'll paste that again for us. I wish you could see my underlines so you can see what I stress. I have to stress it with my voice so it makes uh, the kind of sense I'm trying to communicate. Um, For the woman who has a husband bound by the law to her husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, from the law of marriage to her husband. So she is no longer an adulteress, though she has married another man. Remember, Paul was speaking as one who has been a Pharisee. He loved the law, perhaps in the way a married man loves his wife. Were his wife to die, he would no longer be expected to practice the things which are exclusive to being a married man. Why? Because the base of that relationship has died. Well, when Paul and when we were born again, we died. How do we know that? Galatians 2, 19 and 20, and other places in Romans 6, uh, we read, uh, talk about this. 
But he specifically is is underlining what we're talking about here in Romans 7 when he talks about it in Galatians 2. He says this, For though through... For I, through the law, died to the law that might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in my skin, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He no longer lives by the external Ten Commandments. Now he lives by entrusting himself to the Son of God, who loved him and gave himself up for him. And that's how we are to live. In the same way that a married woman or man loses a, who loses a spouse to death is no longer bound by the relationship of marriage and all of its expectations, when we die to the law, we're no longer bound to it. Now, as a Christian, if you still try to live in a legalistic way, you're bound to it because you haven't accounted your death in Christ to the law so you're still going to keep yourself in bond, bond, bondage to it and you're still going to be miserable it's still going to kill in your life it's still going to be condemnation in your life and you're going to live one of these shoulda coulda or woulda lives you know my wife Lori will say that when you do that <laughs> Hear me clearly. You should all over yourself. Like like if you say, I should have... I, I talked last week about how when my friend Jeff died and I had, I had... He had asked me to do something and I couldn't do it. I asked the Lord and the Lord gave me a definite no. And I said, I couldn't. But then after he died, I was sitting in the car waiting for Lord to come out and I started putting that shit all over myself and I, and I and she said what's wrong and I said you know the last time I talked to him I had to say no to a request and I hate that the last thing I did was deny him a request and I'm sitting here wondering if I should have done it and that was legalism I was I was living I, I was in that little bit of time sitting in the car waiting for Laurie I had put the law on myself and was wondering I was second guessing what I did and, what, and she said did the Lord tell you not to give it and I said yes and she goes so should you have done it and I said no but I still feel bad you know and I think that happens you know someone will pass away and will say I should have visited them more often I should have done more with them. I should have called them more often. I should have been there for them. I should have been there when they died. I should have. Why? That's legalism seeping into our free life in Christ. And Paul in Galatians 2.19 pointed out that dying to the law freed him to have a new relationship. He said, I through the law died to the law so that I might live to God. So dying to the law frees us. And I hope as we're going through this teaching, if you see any legalism in your life, and it doesn't have to be in the place where you worship, we're plenty capable of legalize, legalizing anything. You know, The biggest legalists in the world are little kids in our life who say, stuff like but you told me I could have a cookie you know that kind of thing and uh, the reason I did it was because and I'll give you a legalistic reason why it was really okay to do the wrong thing I have grandchildren I've had children I'm around kids all the time they do it all the time and, and adults will do it too you should have given me what I asked for why because I asked for it you know that kind of thing and, and, and we're not always supposed to so if I hope that through this teaching of Romans 7, 2, and 3, you see whatever law is still affecting you in your life and you renounce it and you die to it. You cast this down. And the reason is, as we go into chapter 8, we're going to be studying about the flesh. And the flesh is legalistic. And you can be free of the requirements of your flesh to live according to the Spirit of God, just like Paul died 
to the um, law so he could be free to live to God. It's, it's so liberating. And in the next verse, Paul is going to go in verse... Um, whoa. I think I skipped a verse. Uh, did I do three and four already? Yeah, I did. I have to redo this. Um, huh. I jumped right in my teaching. I jumped right from... Um, huh. Wow. I jumped right to verse 5. Uh, I'm going to put this in my teaching here. I don't know what happened. I must have accidentally deleted it. Good thing I found it. Um, wow. I don't think in all the teaching I've done, I've done this before. But uh, now I'm going to fix it um, in my teaching and then teach it as we go. Uh, so this will be exciting. This will be real exciting. Um, so I'm going to be looking uh, in the scriptures in my uh, Bible program as we go through this next verse. So um, verse 4 says this. So he takes what he just said and he gives us a therefore. All right. Therefore, my brethren, you have also come dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Wow. Um, so, so why, what is he referring to? Well, since it's a, a letter, he says this, back in, um, back in Romans 6, Starting in verse 2. I'm so I'm going to paste that here. And what Stacy say? He says, When they want to know what they should do about the laws of God, they need to understand that first they made the decision to give their life to law, and then they make their decisions by wanting to serve God, by learning with the heart of God is, what is the heart of God by reading the Bible to know it pleases God. Then we make decisions from the thought of pleasing God. Amen. That's exactly right, Stacy. You know, and, and really what what happens what I've seen, what I have experienced in my my um, life as a believer, and this is by well meaning people. This isn't people that are trying to be legalistic and put it on you. I got saved in the same fellowship that Stacy was saved in, and, and that my wife was saved in. And the day after I was born again, the day I was born again, they handed me this workbook. And the workbook was called The Beginnings of Our Confidence, and I think it was by a guy named David P-H-A-R-R. -R. I'm not sure. I have it in my stuff in my closet somewhere at home. But... Um, what it was, was a 31-day a Bible study, or 52-week Bible study, I can't remember. Um, and all it really was, was do's and don'ts for Christians. And it was, the, it was like the Ten Commandments for Christians. And it was all kinds of stuff that's not even mentioned in the Bible, like smoking and, and um, rock music and stuff like that, right? And so, I mean, it was well-meaning. And it was to help me get a jump start on being a, a new Christian. But what it did was instilled in me, I stepped, I got freed from the law, got born again, and immediately was introduced to a Christian version of law um, that caused me to be afraid that other people would disapprove of me or that other people would look down on me in the church if I did certain things and it became known. And the, the, the intention was to make me behave for safety's sake by any means. But what it does is it completely nullifies the freedom from law that Christ died to give me. And nobody thought it through that way. And, and what it did was it brought misery into my heart 
like I didn't even open it up for a couple of weeks. I'm happy about that because I, I, f I felt so clean and free when I was first born again. Then I started reading this thing. And I'm like, I'm supposed to do all this stuff? You know, and, and uh, I, I had no equipping. I, we, we weren't taught to draw from the Holy Spirit of God at all. So it was all Mike's ability to obey the law of this denomination. And, and, and it brought death into my life, and it brought condemnation into my life. You know, and it, it was misery. Paul here in Romans 7 says, Therefore... Through, he says, Therefore, my brethren, you have also become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him, referring to Jesus, who was raised from the dead for a purpose, that we should bear fruit to God. And when he says we died, he's referring back to Romans 6, where he said, How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus by the Spirit of God, not by someone burying me in water, but by the Holy Spirit baptizing me into one body, like he says in 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, even so, we should walk in the newness of life, that is, um, bearing fruit to God from Romans 7, 4. Walk in newness of life, for if we've been united together with the likeness of his death, certainly we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, so the body of sin might be done away with, so we no longer be slaves to sin, which law made us. So here we are in Romans 7, 4, I'm putting in a bunch of stuff as we go so I can edit this when I go home and um, reprint all these pages. Um, okay. Um, he says in Romans 7, 4 again, I'm going to paste that again in the Bible study. I've never taught like this in a long time. I'm not coming off my notes, but just teaching. Um, so he says, Therefore, my brethren, you have also become dead to the law of the body of Christ, so you can be married to another. And this is the first time in Romans that he's talking about being wed to Jesus, to be the bridegroom. And so uh, he'll be the bridegroom, we'll be the bride, as the body of Christ, we are married to another, to him. And the purpose of it is that we should bear fruit to God. Well, well what did we bear fruit to before? Well, we, we bore fruit... We, we, we bore fruit to the law, right? And what was that fruit? It was death. So if I, like in house church that we do, or if I teach here, that you're obligated to give... You're obligated to serve. You're obligated to show up at every one of these Bible studies or at church. Or you're obligated to serve on the worship team. You're obligated. Whenever we do this, and it happens throughout Christendom, we're actually living according to the law which Christ died to free us from. And it's going to bring condemnation and death. And that's why so many people drift from congregation to congregation because they get tired of being beat up with the law of the law of Christianity. And there's not supposed to be one of those. There's not supposed to be a law of Christendom. Jesus died so we could be free. So next time what we're going to do is we're going to go into chapter um, we're going to go into chapter uh, 7 verse 5 which is what I thought we were going to do now. I, I'm telling you, I'm confessing to you that when I was editing my work as I went along, I must have completely deleted chapter verse 4. So I'm going to go more into depth about church four, uh, verse 4 so that when when I print this as a book 
uh, it's all in there, and then we're going to teach it next time, and then we're going to verse 5. Um, so right now we have to wrap it up because I, I have to get ready to teach in the other room at my um, at my uh, uh, Bible study that I do there. Um, uh, tonight we'll be talking in our um, Truth Seeker Texas Radio um, broadcast Discipleship for Life show that I do, Finding the Entry Point for Ministry. Uh, these are things that I think we're supposed to teach as um, as people who disciple. Um, so um, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give some um, some links that we need, I think, and then we'll um, move on from there. So Father, I thank you so much for uh, those who take the time to be in this Bible study. I ask you to be with them. Um, as we go through these things, I ask you to bless us in the things that we've learned. I ask you to reveal to us uh, any legalism that we're experiencing in our everyday life and the way that we live as believers in Jesus, uh, um, the ways that we, we place ourselves and others under expectations and under uh, condemnation. And um, I ask you to... to to quicken our souls, to sense the presence of the death that Paul talks about uh, in Romans um, in, in the other verses that we talked about today um, in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians where he talks about the ministry of condemnation and death um, and, and how um, we inadvertently write uh, law on, on new stones that we put into our lives instead of just depending upon the Spirit's um, prompting and guiding us. I thank you for these things. And I ask you, when we see those things, that you prompt us through your Spirit to cast them down, repent of those things, and ask Him to show you uh, how to walk in the newness of life, which isn't according to someone's expectations on the outside, coming into our souls, but from the Holy Spirit guiding us step by step. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the freedom and the liberation of that. And I ask you to bless us in Jesus' name. Father, I ask you to be with my friend Harleen, who is going to tune in tonight to this and to the radio, but who has COVID and is feeling bad down there in Houston. This is our sister in Christ that we stay with whenever we visit down there. And I ask you to heal her and uh, keep her well. Um, and I ask you to prompt others in her area to serve her and feed her and take care of her and her dog. And I thank you for that. And the others who are ill around us, I ask you to bless them. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, all right. Well, I have some links that I want to share before I sign off. I do this every time as a help uh, to us. Thank you, Donna. I thank you. Um, let's see. Um, you're right, you're right, Stacy said, when you married Laurie, she didn't have to write down a set of rules for you to follow and know the police her. You just needed to get to know her and listen to her and please her. That's the same. But at the same time, there was the external expectations. But now I don't even think about those because I love her, right? And then uh, Einstein, which is Liz, said, maybe this is weird. Could slave to man be said of slaves trying not to sin? Uh, it's not exactly the same. Slave to man, a uh, slave to sin is is uh, we're we're going to go more into depth about that, but he's personalizing slave uh, sin as we go through seven. We'll see this that he's personalizing sin and talking about the power of sin, which which is basically Satan working through sin. So um, becoming a slave to sin is like being slave to a being. And not slave to individual infractions. If you say slaves to trying not to sin, then you also you kind of saying slaves to not doing this sin or that sin or that sin. It's much bigger than that. That's what I. That's the take I have. As we go through seven, Liz, you'll see what I mean. And uh, next time I see you face to face, we can talk about that. Um, sometimes we eat meals and stuff together. So okay, love y'all. Uh, um, let me see. Um, there's um 
this link that's important. Um, uh, let me copy it so I can use it for the next thing. And you can go there and see last week's video. Um, there's this link which contains a bunch of articles, over 260 of them. Um, and then there is this link which is how you are able to tune in to our streaming radio broadcast. Um, oops, it didn't copy it. Um, copy link address. Go to here. Oops. Nope. That's not good. I'll just do it by hand. I went to copy it off my Facebook post from earlier and it gave me a whole bunch of characters. Um, you, can co you can go to that link from Facebook here or from your on your phone or whatever and um, you can you know, listen in on a radio station. And if you want, you can um, call this phone number and be a part of the show. And uh, everybody, you can be a part of our, our radio show. So I'm going to head over there now and get ready. I have everything warmed up, but now it's time for me to uh, to go uh, broadcast. I hope you all tune in. Tonight we're going to be talking about a topic uh, called Finding the Entry Point for Ministry, which since we're all ministers of reconciliation according to the scriptures, then um, uh, it's important for us to learn in discipleship how to enter into that relationship. Uh, wh where's a good point to start in um, addressing an, a need and serving somebody else? So we're going to talk about that and kick some things around. I hope somebody calls in. I always love that. I love you guys. I will see you next time. God bless you. Bye-bye.